It is my pleasure to introduce this morning Mr. Gerald Yagen, the founder of our school systems, and Dr. Joel English. So let's join us for a conversation with Mr. Yagen. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Another day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, we are, aha, uh -huh. we are uh, w uh, with uh, an impressive group of our educators uh, this morning. And uh, you're right, um, uh, Mr. Yagan says an another day. And, and I would say that every morning around nine uh, o'clock, we, we say, hello, sir, yeah, another day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, guys, what we wanted to do is uh, just take a, a little bit of informal time to, to talk a little bit about, um, uh, well, our day, and I think we'll get to that, kind of to the present day, but, but what I'd like to do is kind of take us back to, to where, where I wasn't and you were. Um, we have uh, in our presence today our newest employee, our newest hire, uh, that's Mr. Sasso from our upcoming Charlotte location. Mr. Sasso, you with us? There he is back there. Uh, Great to see you. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Sasso is our future. And uh, sir, we also have with us uh, our most long-standing employee, yourself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about who would that be other than me. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, is it Jackie Frederick? So Jackie Frederick at our uh, corporate office has been with us for 30, I believe it's 37 years on her, on her plaque. Um, and. Uh, it's interesting, uh, at, at the, we, we had a ceremony in November where we honored some of our very long-standing employees and we had a 20-year plaque and a 35-year plaque and she got a 35-year plaque just because that was the category. And she was troubled all day long because it was the 35-day plaque but she had been here 37 years so we got that plaque changed for her. So earlier this week uh, we uh, congratulated a lot of our administrative assistants uh, except I went around and I congratulated a different group of right. ladies, predominantly ladies, uh, and I wish them all happy Secretary's Day. <laughs> because when I got started in this company, it was 1969, I was 23 years old, I didn't have an administrative assistant, I had a secretary. <laughs> Actually, she was a receptionist. Uh, and back in those days, the young ladies that went to high school and then they graduated from high school. Some of them went off to college, of course, but most of the ones that I knew, they went into a trade position or uh, not a four-year degree or two-year degree. They went off to a secretarial school. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the young ladies went to secretarial schools. And the most, one of the most popular television shows at that time was a one-hour show and uh, it came on every week, and the man solved the crime by the end of the hour. Right. And he was an attorney, and he had a secretary. And some of you that are the old, a little bit older, ask your parents if you're not sure about this. The secretary's name was Della Street, and the attorney's name was Perry Mason. Mm -hmm. And in the last about, 50, at the 50 minute, 55 minute mark, the person that had actually committed the crime was in the witness stand and Perry Mason was cross-examining him and he boxed him into a corner and that person confessed. <laughs> uh, and at the end of the uh, hour, a lot of times Perry Mason had a uh, short conversation with his most trusted employee, Della Street, his secretary. <laughs> so. In the corporate office this week, I went around and a number of the people that had worked that in the reception, uh, mainly in the reception positions, and I congratulated them on Happy Secretary's Day. I had sent them a card with a real stamp on it. They had received the card um, delivered by a federal employee, a U.S. mailman. <laughs> and, um, 
I, uh, and they also got some roses. So, uh, and we appreciate them. A lot of times we overlook the people at the lower level. We only think so much about the people at the higher level. And I try never to forget about the lower level employees, no matter what level they're on. Uh, actually, yesterday I was spending a couple hours um, writing birthday cards. So just about everybody in this room, if you've been here at least a year and if you've had a birthday, will have received a birthday card. And you, you maybe don't think about it, you say, oh, another birthday card, I'm not even going to open up that one. Well, of course, you know inside is a personal signature. When, when I'm doing hundreds of them every month, and uh, close to a thousand by the end of the year, uh, it comes to you um, from the corporate office, from the fifth floor of our last building. Uh, and those of you that are from out of town and you sometimes wonder, why does your corporate headquarters, why is it in the glass building? Uh, that also has a short story. Just go back in television. Uh, I think it was in the late seven, no, early 80s, I guess it was. The most popular show on television, and it was called Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> and the show started off, and it was a video shot of the city of Dallas and all these glass buildings. And uh, we, at that time, we had a very good contract. We had a contract with the uh, uh, Israeli government. Uh, the Israeli government, we, we owned a temp service, and, they had, and we also owned a high-tech recruiting firm, and they contacted us, uh, Israeli Aircraft uh, Services, uh, and they, this was during the Reagan administration, uh, and they said, we have just received a contract from the U.S. government and we are going to train people, uh, or we need to train some people to work on Israeli fighter planes. And if you've ever seen Top Gun before, where they go out and they play with these airplanes out over the water, or they were there in Top Gun, I think, is mainly in the desert. Uh, but uh, they had been awarded a contract at Oceana Naval Air Station here in Virginia Beach. And it was uh, to fly these fighter planes as an aggressor force against the um, U.S. Navy. And they were Navy pilots in them, uh, but they needed people to maintain, they needed aircraft mechanics. Uh, and so what we would do is we would recruit people coming out of the military that had been working on aircraft in the Navy, and they would come to work for us. The name of the company was called Delcor. Uh, and uh, the uh, planes would go out and they'd fly, and the aircraft were at, they'd fly in a uh, combat-like situations with the American modern uh, fighter planes, and they were, the Americans were mainly using F-14s. That's the same thing that they use in Top Gun out west. Uh, and, uh, but the Israelis had worked out a deal. The U.S. government did not want to give any more money to Israel. So the Israelis had figured out, in collusion with some of the people in our government, we're going to get money to Israel. And what we're going to do is we are going to, um, the Americans needed to had this contract for these, uh, ag this aggressor force. And the Israelis said, U.S. government, U.S. Navy, we will give you these airplanes to fly in your aggressor force. Um, and we're not going to charge you anything for the airplanes. Uh, and, uh, but the only thing is, you're going to have to need how to know how to maintain them. It's a complex airplane, and so you ought to pay us to maintain them. So the U.S. Navy said, okay, we'll pay you to maintain the aircraft, but you're not going to charge it. Israeli said, we're not charging you anything. And um, that was a very good deal for the U.S. Navy. Think of it like the Gillette Company does the same thing. We'll give you the razor, but you've got to buy the blades from us. <laughs> and the blades are very expensive. <laughs> so the Israelis uh, took the money, and they paid me a little bit. And with that money, that's mainly how that building got built. Yeah. So I went to Dallas, and uh, my wife and I, and a local architect for you in the uh, local area, his name was Laszlo Arani. And uh, he was a person that also built the Virginia Beach Public Library. And it was a very complex building to build because of all those panes of glass 
really attract the sun in the summertime and mm -hmm. heat up the building a lot. And, uh, but he did a wonderful job at it. Uh, and he, uh, they were building the building. The building was coming up out of the ground. They were starting to put the glass on. It was going to be finished in about, oh, um, maybe another three months. And he would call me every once in a while. He'd go out and check on the project of it and such. Um, and uh, he called me up one day, and uh, Laszlo was originally from uh, Budapest, Hungary. And him and his wife escaped from Hungary when the Russians came in with the tanks, and they occupied the city, and they took over the country of Hungary. Uh, but, and he came to the United States as a refugee. And so uh, he called me up one day and he says, Jerry, I just want you to know um, I'm going to finish your building. And I said, Laszlo, I know you're going to finish my building. You know, it's, it's almost done, another three months or such. And uh, Laszlo said, I'm going to finish that building. It's going to get done. And I just wanted to call you and promise you that it would get done. And I didn't think very much more about it. Uh, matter of fact, that, that was just a couple days after they were, Laszlo was a concert violinist, and in front of our building there's a big blue sculpture, and it's called, the name of the sculpture is called Whole Notes, mm. like a musical note. Mm -hmm. And that was, that sculpture was built by, the, by Globe Iron, who were the steel company that built the building, and they were good friends of Laszlo. And the head of Globe Iron was also uh, a concert violinist. <clears throat> and uh, he asked me about a sculpture. I said, yes, let's put a sculpture in front of the building. And, um, but I didn't know that day when Laszlo called me. A few days later, he died. Uh, very, very sad. He was in a hospital up in uh, New York. He knew he was going to die. He was in the hospital and he was planning his funeral. Hmm. He was writing the music that they were going to play for his funeral. And uh, so that's how the building got built. As far as what happened to the Israeli aircraft, hmm. it lasted for about three years. And then there was a spy in uh, New York City. His name was Hassan Fus. He was an Israeli citizen. He was spying on the United States of America. He got arrested for spying. He was thrown into jail. Uh, and the American government got very upset. How in the world could a ally of the United States ever be spying on us? We were supposed to be friends with them. Within uh, two months, the contract was canceled. The airplanes went back to Israel. They're now, those airplanes are all gone. There's one left in the desert, and that one I'm talking to them about. Hmm. I think that might make a very good souvenir. <laughs> So, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Yegan, um, uh, I want to I point something out, and I wa we're, we're going to get m back to airplanes here in a minute, um, mm. but, um, but I want to point out that uh, in, in almost everything I've heard you say, there's a thread of personal in there from um, uh, the thinking about these employees and writing every one of us uh, a personalized um, a birthday card, which raise your hand if you've ever gotten a uh, personal birthday card from Mr. Yegan. So, oh, no. uh, from, from, from that from that very <coughs> personal approach you take to to the employees who work all over the country, to the personal relationship. If I, if I asked you about your building, you go into a personal relationship with um, uh, uh, with with the architect and 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 all that. And uh, a lot of people say a lot about how you do your business, and it's an extremely, extremely savvy way, but it's also a very personalized way. Th this, this company's you, isn't it? It really is. And uh, it, I don't want to frighten anybody in this room, but it started to scare me this, this past year. I turned 71 years of age, and uh, I have to think about this. I'm not going to be here but maybe another 30 or 40 years. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> but my wife and I talk about that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'm sure as, you, as all of you get older, I'm sure that with your spouses, you'll talk about it also. Um, but I've got plans. I, the, we're we're going to be around for long after I'm gone. Um, you, uh, the, the company started in uh, 1969. Hmm. I went to uh, Virginia Tech, I uh, got out, and I was looking for a job. And so 
I bought the local newspaper. Here, the newspaper is Virginian Pilot. I used to work for that newspaper. I was um, 13 years old, I believe. Mm -hmm. I delivered newspapers. Rubber Every, band or yes. roll? Oh, no, no, I would fold them like fold this. Fold them, yeah. Yeah, put them in my, I had a bicycle with yeah. a basket up front, and I'd stuff them in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, then I had to, every two weeks, I had to go by and try to collect the money for it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And people sometimes moved on me, and, you know, it was, I think it was a, less than a dollar a week. Yeah. But that was a lot of money for me. In my spare time, I went around, I sold greeting cards. And um, the uh, a little box of greeting cards, I think they were like a dollar and a half. And everybody sent greeting cards, the birthday cards. I, I still send out birthday cards, Christmas cards. I think just about everybody got a Christmas card. You don't um, have a deal with that card company, and that's why you write us all a card. No. Okay, no, okay, no, okay. No, no. okay. I have a deal with the post office. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and uh, all my relatives and such, they all get personalized birthday cards and such from me also. Uh, and, um, but anyway, so I was uh, out of school, I was looking for a job, I checked in the newspaper and there was a uh, company called Management Recruiters. They were a headhunting firm. That's back in the earlier days, if you needed a job, you would go see a recruiting company, employment agency, and they would find you a job and then you would have to play, pay them an employment fee. If they found you a job for uh, $8,000, uh, the fee might be uh, $1,200 or uh, $1,200, 15%. Uh, that was a lot of money back then. And uh, where'd you get the money from? You'd have to get a loan, you have to get it from your parents or something like that. That's how a lot of people got jobs. Uh, so I went to this uh, employment agency called Management Recruiters and they were a franchised operation. And uh, they uh, told me, you know, you don't have any experience. You're right out of school. But boy, do we have the perfect job for you. And uh, my eyes lighted up and lit up. And I'm, yes, tell me about the job. I said, the guy said, look around here. There was a room with about 20 people all sitting at desks in the room. And they were all talking on the telephones. And uh, you could come to work for us. And this was in a downtown about two or three blocks from here. Uh -huh. It was called the Virginia National Bank Building. It's a tall bank building that's here uh, along the water. And uh, corporate, uh, big corporate headquarters building today from another bank, I think. But, uh, and I said, well, can I make a lot of money? They said, sure you can. Uh, you probably make $15,000 a year or something like that, which was a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I thought that was wonderful. I said, well, what do I, how much will you start me at? I said, well, you can make money, uh, your first paycheck with, would be about two weeks from after this. And I said, well, how much would it be? However much you're gonna earn. You're gonna be on straight commission. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay, I can do that. Uh, being a paper boy, you're on straight commission. Selling greeting cards, you're on straight commission. Everything I did in my life, I've been on straight commission. There, running a business. Right. If we don't make any money, straight commission. I don't get paid. Right. So, um, so I went to work for them, and the first person that I placed in a job was somebody who was a controller for a local um, plastic company here in the Norfolk area. And I made some money and I kept working and uh, within um, about six months, I said, what in the world am I doing here? Why am I working for these people? And they're getting like 70% of the money and I only get 30% of the money. So I resigned. Mm -hmm. I moved back to my mother's house here in Norfolk and I, she had a spare bedroom and I put a phone in there and I started working out of that phone. Mm -hmm. I worked there for about three months doing that and then I, I had earned enough money, so I decided to rent a, um, a bit, an office here in the uh, downtown Norfolk area, and I ha started hiring other people on straight commission. I hired a secretary. Her name, is, her name was Sandy Dozier. I gave her $50 a week and a, I think 1% of the money that came into the company. 
hmm. which was not a lot of money back then. Today it would be a lot of money. Uh, and um, I was operating an employment agency. Within about four or five years, I had a dozen employment agencies throughout the United States. We had a market niche. We were taking people coming out of the military. Defense contractors were hiring them. If you worked on a radar system in the Navy, you came out and then uh, I would find a job for you working for RCA that maybe built those radar systems. They would put you in a uniform, an RCA uniform, and they'd send you right back to the Navy and you'd be a technical representative from the uh, corporation for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And we started taking predominantly people that were in the electronic industry. And um, then with these offices around the country, we had job fairs. Uh, every weekend we would have a job fair somewhere in the country and we'd have maybe uh, 500 people coming into a big hotel like this and we'd have 50 companies and uh, they would set up on a Friday evening. You walk around with your resume, you go to the different companies and say, this is what I do. And the guy said, oh yes, we like you. We want to see you. To, uh, I have available Saturday at 2.30 or Sunday at uh, 3 o'clock. When would you like to come talk to us? Here's our room number and come to our room and we will interview at, at that time. And that was working so, so good. Hmm. Then uh, one day, the city of Norfolk, the city we're in, uh, this was during the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War started winding down and everybody got out of the military. They were releasing them all. They came to me and they said, Mr. Yagen, we see how many, this company was called Search and Recruit International. That's a name that I made up, made it look very fancy. International was like, we were all over. When I made up the name, we were in one city right here. Um, so uh, they uh, told us that uh, the city of Norfolk came and said, uh, we'd like to um, see if you can place all these veterans that are getting out of the military. We have a government contract to find them jobs, and we'd like to help. We want your company to help us find jobs for them. And I'm thinking, these are guys that are running through the jungle with a rifle in their hand. As a matter of fact, I noticed these young men that were marching around here. They had M1 rifles. Uh, those are the same rifles. I marched around. I was never in the military. I marched around in a uniform with one of those rifles. Uh, I went to a local high school here. When I was 16 years old, I went to my mother and said, Mom, okay, I'm 16, I'm old enough to move out of the house, I'm young enough to start my life, uh, I want to go off to school. And she said, Jerry, we don't have the money for that. You know, I'm working in a bank, I'm, you know, I just, I, it's a low paying job, uh, I'm putting bread on the table for you and your sister, we can't send you off to school. I said, don't worry about it, I got it all worked out. I'm gonna be working while I go into school. I went to a school close to here called Frederick Military Academy in Portsmouth, Virginia. I lived there in the dorms. There were 400 students going to school there. And uh, we marched in the afternoons. We practiced with our rifles. I think they were getting us ready for Vietnam. Mm. But um, it never came from me. So uh, I, um, I would talk to the city of uh, Norfolk and I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Yes, uh, we will find them uh, jobs but they don't have the skills that they really need because I know that from my employment agency, we need electronics people. So I will train them and we started a school. And the mm. school would take, uh, they would take people coming out of the military if they had been to an A school. They knew a little bit about electronics. We would place them uh, into, a, put them into our school. Uh, the school was located over in Virginia Beach and we would train them uh, in something completely new. They'd go to school for 90 days, three months, 90 day wonders they were. At the end of three months, we would find a job for them. And uh, So the, your, your first school was a 90 day electronics program. And the people had prior preference in the military. Got it. And they, uh, the first school, and we would, uh, the name of the school was EIT. Electronic Institute of Technology. That was the name of our first school uh -huh. located here in Tidewater. And um, I didn't get paid unless the person got a job. Hmm. I, I was so confident of it. I said, look, you don't have to pay me anything unless that student gets a job. And uh, 
it, uh, I think they paid me $3,000 at that time. Uh, and this was in the early 70s as Vietnam was going away. Uh, and we would uh, train these students in electronic. What were we teaching them? We were teaching them something completely new. Nobody had ever heard of this before. This new th subject that we were teaching that I would learned from my employment agency days. We were taking A school graduates out of the military and we were teaching them digital. Mm -hmm. Something <laughs> that many of you maybe have never even heard of before. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and uh, that was the first school we ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I learned something. Uh, now, I was getting my money from the city. I didn't have to be a creditor or anything like that. But um, it was suggested to me that maybe that we should try to expand a little bit, upgrade the school, get it accredited. And there was uh, an accrediting agency that we applied to. And um, matter of fact, it was the, the man that I'd hired to uh, run the school for me. And his name was McLeod. Mm -hmm. And I think we still have an award or something, if I, or we had one. Any ever. schools give out the McLeod Award, um, and there that comes go. from your yeah. first school director. He mm -hmm. was our first school director. And uh, we, um, he suggested, Jerry, get the school accredited. I said, okay, go ahead and you take care of it. And he, uh, the first school, uh, we had a visit from the accrediting agency, and was there one called Nats? Yeah. Right. Okay. That is uh, ACCSC in a previous life yes. called Nets. Okay. And so um, they came and they looked at our school and, uh, and I told Neil McLeod, I, I hope uh, we get accredited. Good luck to you. Mm -hmm. And three days later, Neil died. Mm -hmm. Mr. McLeod died. He had a heart attack one night. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, this is the guy that was leading our accreditation team. So the next day I called the accrediting agency and I said, um, yeah, I hate to tell you this, but the, our school director passed away and I guess that kills our accreditation. You know, this is a man that, who's in charge of the school. You came in, you're gonna accredit the school based upon this key employee and he's now passed away. And they said, don't worry about it. We're accrediting the school, not the individual. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, um, and again, at that time, the school was a very small portion. We were in the employment agency business, uh, and that was the very first school. EIT, Electronics Institute of Technology, and uh, I remember also we had a great television commercial. How are we doing? Okay. <laughs> uh, we had a great television commercial. I was in the cars back in those days, and I collected Ferraris. Uh, and Anybody else collect Ferraris? <laughs> no. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. So I had a beautiful red, um, I had several Ferraris, but I had a beautiful red one. And we, um, we were doing a television commercial. As you're driving into Norfolk, you see the skyline, kind of like Dallas, but our skyline right. here isn't as good. <laughs> uh, and the, we put a young girl in that, the, that they had gotten, and uh, she had blonde hair and the convertible Ferrari, and she was driving in the downtown Norfolk. She was gonna go for, to become a secretary or whatever she was gonna do in this bright red Ferrari. <laughs> and the music in the back is saying, EIT will set you free, let you be whatever you wanna be. And I didn't know until later, the girl was 16 years old and didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> but, was a great commercial. <laughs> All right, so then I hired somebody from another school, and it was a woman, uh, and uh, she uh, comes in, and the school is now accredited. Uh, this is a school in Virginia Beach, EIT, and she said, Mr. Yagan, we got to make a change. Mm. You know, you're mainly training men, and that's that, and by that time, we started getting uh, Title IV and such. Uh, and she said, uh, your, main, your, your school is all about men. The, where the market is, is women. And you have to have some programs that are women. So what, what can we change the name to? We can start adding different programs. And, but we can't call the school EIT or Electronics Institute of Technology. So one of our key person in charge of all of our admissions 
said uh, this is called the Tidewater area of Virginia Beach along where the water is. And he said, let's call it, because it was Electronic Institute of Technology, let's call it Tidewater uh, Technology. Let me see how they, how they Tidewater can't Tidewater Tech? Tidewater Tech, yes. Mm -hmm. Tidewater Tech, yes. I, I thought there was a third word in there, but there wasn't. Tidewater Tech. We called it Tidewater Tech. And I said, why do you want to call it that? He says, well, we have a local community college here called Tidewater Community College. And they'll say, they'll go home and tell their parents, Mom, I'm going to Tidewater. She's, and she would say, great, my son's going to Tidewater Community College. <laughs> and they would get confused, and everybody would be excited in the factory, in the uh, family because he was going to Tidewater. He was actually going to Tidewater Tech. And we uh, opened up a, uh, a school on the peninsula, I think was the first branch campus, and then the next one I think was in uh, uh, Norfolk, and then the next one was in uh, uh, Chesapeake. And pretty soon we started opening up some other schools elsewhere in the country. Hmm. And that was the beginning of the school. Yeah, so I, I mean, really, uh, the, the story I'm hearing is one of uh, entrepreneurialism, um, one of uh, workforce development from, from absolute beginning. I mean, that, yes. that, that's what this is all about, getting, putting people in jobs. And then this interesting thread of how people are going to hear a name, right? From, from your trick with uh, <laughs> International mm -hmm. um, uh, to your, your branding uh, for, the, for the area. Um, and that, that sense of um, uh, always marketing, always workforce development, and always putting people into a, a better place. Um, when did you start to realize that the future of your organization was going to become more about education and less about raw uh, placement and recruiting? And job training. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we found that the schools were making more money than the employment agencies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the employment agencies, one by one, I either closed them or sold them to other groups. Mm. And, and we kind of got out of the employment aspect of it. And then Until just this year when you closed your last employment agency. Yes, right. uh, called ProTemps. Right. We had a temporary help service. And uh, that firm was called ProTemps. Matter of fact, their last day of operation was about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we, had two we had worked it down to two employees. For the last couple of years, uh, it was making a profit, but it had a lot of problems. But the employee had been there with me for almost 20 years. Her name is Tammy Conrad. She was a very loyal employee, so I was very loyal to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was getting very sick, and she passed away. Right. And uh, when she passed away, I knew that was the end. That, of their business. Um, she was a wonderful woman, a great leader, and, uh, and your loyalty to, to both the business and to her personally. Again, that thread of uh, uh, personal. Uh, you, you, you run this business as a, as a man, not as a corporation, you know, and, and I, I appreciate that very much. Well, I think about every one of the employees, and I know we sometimes have employees that have problems to us and they don't work out, or stuff, but that, every business has that. <clears throat> but an employee that works in the business, uh, you know, now I'm going to tell you something. Please don't everybody call me next week. But if you were to call me at my office, you'd get through to me. If one of your uh, students calls up and I want to talk to the president, and they would get through to me, and they would complain about their school. They would tell me about what they, we, we all had, know about students like this. They'd tell me what a terrible Things have been done to, to them. <clears throat> and uh, I get their name and I get their phone number. And I would say, okay, unless somebody, unless they say something like, the school director is embezzling money and I can, I saw it myself. Um, I, would, I would say, okay, I will look in it, look up on it about the problem and see what I can do. And I will hang up the phone and immediately the next call will be either to the regional director or to the school director uh, and say, I just got a call from a student. We have a problem with a student. That's our customer. Right. Let's see what we can do to resolve the issue and not lose, a, you know, not lose one of our clients. 
Uh, and, uh, but I'm accessible. Uh, I call people sometimes and, you know, you can't get past the receptionist or the secretary uh, or the administrative assistant. But uh, you can get through to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here we are, late 80s, going into the 90s, um, a group of four, five, six Tidewater Tech campuses, and then aviation happens. How do, how do we do this? I, 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 I kind of want to start is when, when were, did your fascination with aviation begin? I'm guessing that was as a child, but, but that and, and how did you turn how did you mix business with pleasure like that? Okay. Um, when I was a, that paper boy, I used to build model airplanes all the time. Uh, my stepfather was in the uh, American Air Force. We were working, we were living over in Europe at the time, but I'd go to the base and I'd watch the planes taking off. At first they had propellers and later on they had jet engines. Um, I was born the year after uh, World War II ended. Uh, so, um, but I saw um, airplanes all my life, so I used to build them. I used to have radio-controlled airplanes, excuse me, they're not radio, they're control line airplanes. Today they're radio-controlled, they're called drones. But I'd have them under wires, and I'd stand in a circle, and the airplane would fly around me, and I'd control it going up and down. That's the first flying that I ever did in my life as a kid. I went off to college uh, in my sophomore year, I uh, joined the Hokey Flying Club in Blacksburg, Virginia, at Virginia Tech, and uh, I started taking a few flying lessons. And then I, uh, but it was very expensive for a kid like me, uh, with not a lot of money. Uh, and then I, um, uh, when I went to, the first year I went to Tech, in 1964, it was the first year you didn't have to wear a uniform to go to Virginia Tech, and I just came from a military school. That was great, <laughs> and the Vietnam War was still going on. I don't have to wear a uniform. I'm not gonna wear one. Lived in the dormitory. And another important thing happened in 1964. It, the Cadet Corps went away, and it's, well, it's still there, but it's, it's no longer mandatory. And it was the first year at Virginia Tech they had girls there, <laughs> thousands of young men there, and they had 16 girls. <laughs> so I knew, I'm, I'm not even going to try that. There are lines in front of the girls' dormitory. There was one, one little dorm <clears throat> where all the girls lived, all 16 of them, and their chaperones. Right. Um, <clears throat> so there was another school close to Blacksburg, Virginia, it was called Radford. Mm -hmm. That's where all the girls were. It was purely a girls' school. So at that time, uh, I still had a fascination with cars, uh, and I was driving a Jaguar at that time. Uh, and um, I went uh, over to the, uh, this, no, this was my sophomore year, my second year. I went over to say, well, I wonder what kind of girls I can meet over in, uh, at Radford. And they had like a little meeting room, uh, a little cafe where you could go in and get drinks. Nothing alcoholic, in, but uh, get drinks. And you could mingle with, with other girls, could mingle with their fellow students on a, on a study break or whatever. And, uh, and boys from tech could come over and meet the girls. So I had my Jaguar, and I went over to Radford. And um, I started talk like normally I would start talking to girls. I, I was very good. I can approach people very easily. Uh, I'm great at picking up girls, in, and I was back then, okay? Not, I don't do that anymore. Uh, but there's some boys that are very shy with that. I'm not shy. I learned how to speak very quickly. I was a paper boy. I could sell. I was selling things door to door. I was a good salesperson. I went there, and I met this girl that was in the dormitory, they were in this little um, cafe-like, and I said, would you like to come out to my car and watch television? She said, what? <laughs> now, wait a minute, this is 1966, I think, 55, 66. Uh, television, there were only three networks, uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS. It was all over antennas. There was no cable. Uh, and I have a television set in my car. She said, I want to see this. <laughs> she was wondering where this was going to go to. Her name was Elaine. So we went out in, in my car, 
And we sat out there and talked. And I talk, told her about my thoughts about the philosophy of life. And we watched television. It was a little Sony television set with an antenna that you plug into the cigarette lighter in this Jaguar <laughs> out in the uh, parking lot of the, uh, of the college. Uh, and uh, a few weeks later, uh, I, I even dated her a couple times since then, and I told her, I said, tomorrow I'm going to solo an airplane. I'm going to fly an airplane for the first time. So if you hear an airplane flying overhead, go out and wave at me, and uh, I will try to circle your dormitory. <laughs> and I went out for my solo flight, my first flight, and I flew over the dormitory. And she waved at me. She told me she waved. I was too busy up there flying that airplane to look. <laughs> but I was at about 1,000 feet over the, over the college. And that was a woman that I later on married. And I, I said, good, good morning, goodbye this morning. And she said, don't be late. And the traffic was backed up from, from Virginia Beach all the way to downtown Norfolk this morning. So, and I kiss her goodbye every morning. And <laughs> That's awesome. So that was the beginning of the airplane. Excellent, excellent. That, that's phenomenal. Um, you know, we don't have tons of time more, but uh, obviously the, the schools have grown and developed, um, and uh, and we've got 18 uh, going strong now. Um, gonna, by the end of the year, we'll have a, another one. Uh, by the beginning of next year, we'll be thinking about another one. Um, and and you know, our our growth. Uh, there was a time where we had very rapid growth. I think our growth right now is probably more controlled and, and, and thoughtful. Concentrated. Yeah, yeah. concentrated, exactly. Um, but uh, I guess the one last question I want to ask is, um, given where we are now and given where, where your, your passion and personal approach to your business has, has taken you, what, what do you see? Um, and uh, wh what would you like to tell us about um, what you think is going to happen next and, and where you'd like to see us go? There's a lot of things happening in our segment of the market. Um, we're a private for profit school. Uh, I'm not ashamed of making a profit. Um, I'm, matter of fact, I'm very proud of making a profit and uh, everybody in this room helps our company make a profit. Um, I think that, um, I don't know who you voted for in the last election. I thought the candidate that won the election talked too much. Uh, if he could just keep his mouth shut. A little bit that would have helped me a lot uh, and but I end up probably about four months before the election I started telling everybody I've made a decision I've decided on the lesser of the two evils and I decided on the man that won the election my wife voted for him too the biggest problem was my daughter she's very liberal she lives at the beach with her husband and her two daughters, my two granddaughters. I also have a son who lives in San Jose, California. Um, but um, I, th I think that um, in the future looks extremely good. Uh, the, we have a new uh, director of education for the government, mm -hmm. and you maybe don't know that, but her, her past history, her and her husband started an aviation maintenance school. It's a high school in, is she from Wisconsin? Uh, Michigan. Michigan, yes. Uh, and then they started another school that trains aviation maintenance to people that go off and work as missionaries. So they're very much involved in the aviation. So I think that's a very good sign for us at our type of business. There's a huge demand for aircraft mechanics. There's a, we try to look at things where there are jobs out there for, like nursing is a good example for the Centura School. Trades, uh, they are, um, um, it, the a welding. Uh, we have somebody in our, uh, uh, in their uh, accounting department, Betty Aldridge. Her son just graduated from a welding college uh, and he just went to work this past week at New Brindu Shipbuilding in Dry Dock. Uh, and he's hoping to work on submarines instead of ships, surface ships. I said, why does he want to do that as a welder? They make more money. And they have already told him if he would like to move to Hawaii 
new for new ship and dry dock. This is somebody who just started a brand new job, a young kid who's like, I think he's maybe 20 or 21 years old. They're sending welders off to uh, Honolulu to work in Pearl Harbor that the shipyard's got a contract over there with there. I guess it's Ingalls. Uh, so I like things that where the people, when they graduate, they don't just have a degree on their, they've got a job that they can go to work at. So yeah. that's what I see us concentrating even more. Very good. Well, uh, Mr. Yagen, um, uh, there is no way to count the number of people whose careers you've started. No way to count it. No way to count it. Um, but there's a way to count how many um, uh, uh, careers that uh, follow you and, and, and need you today, and that's about a 1,000 employees. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been one of them for about 15 years, close to 15 years now, and I, I appreciate your dedication to your employees in a very personal style, um, your dedication to um, uh, high standards in education, um, uh, your absolute personal passion for what you do um, in, uh, in, in all of our areas. Uh, something special happens uh, in, two thousand, in, in two years. You know what special happens in two years? Uh, let me think. Uh, 64, 74. Our, Tell me. Our first, em <laughs> our first employee receives his 50-year plaque. Uh, wow! <laughs> uh, for for work with us, and um, uh, if I've if I've done those numbers right, or is it? <laughs> oh, wait a minute! I know who that is. Yeah, that's you right. caught me on that one once before. Ex exactly, <laughs> exactly, and uh, I certainly look forward to uh, celebrating that anniversary with you. You will. Um, and uh, and uh, meanwhile, on behalf of the students, uh, the faculty in front of us, um, and all of those you impact, you impact. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good morning. <coughs> Mr. Yagan. Yeah. Is this working? Do you remember the first time we met? What? Do you remember the first time we met? Oh my gosh. Would you like me to refresh your memory? Refresh my memory. I'm getting old. We were, we were flying to South Carolina because you wanted to start a HVAC program. Oh, yes. And you said, Dennis, do you want to fly the plane? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and 15 seconds later, he said, remove your hands from my plane. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, this is a long time coming, so I would like to read this to you. In recognition of life's accomplishments, the Education Department of Ames, Centura, and Tidewater Tech is honored to present you with the Founders Award. The countless number of lives you have touched by providing quality hands-on training make the education programs a direct reflection of your involvement. The contribution you provide is now expanding internationally. Our foreign students will have the opportunity to experience the unique learning styles with career certifications upon graduation. The faculty, staff, and home office of AIM, Centura College, and Tidewater Tech thank you for allowing us to contribute our talents to your vision of building careers for the communities we serve. Now, Diane mm -hmm. gave you all kinds of information to put on your plaque. Ah. And I, would like, I would like to show the audience. Mm -hmm. It's a P-51. Thank you. The, um, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, most of you are aware of I have a, uh, I don't collect Ferraris anymore, I collect something else. <laughs> but uh, I used to collect stamps as a kid. <laughs> I had stamps from all over the world, that's how I learned geography. Uh, this is a P-51 Mustang. Uh, it was built during the Second World War. Uh, it was named after a horse because the men that went off to fight 
the last war that I think we really won, the last war where we occupied the capital of the other country and where they surrendered uh, during the war. But it was uh, P-51, it was uh, named after this uh, horse uh, that all the people that went off to fight in the war, that their fathers had crossed the United States in covered wagons in and, and with, on horseback. The name of that wild, dynamic horse was called the Mustang. Mm -hmm. And so everybody learned what the Mustang was from their fathers. And in the war, they went off to fly the Mustang and fight in the Mustang. And so that was 1944, 45. And now these men came back to the United States and they got jobs and they went to work and they became middle-aged people. And they got in their 40s and 50s. Now they were making more money. They got what's called disposable income. They could spend that money. And in 1964 and a half, the Ford Motor Company decided they were going to build a new car. What are they going to call it? <laughs> the Mustang. So that's what this airplane is. Last Saturday, I was flying the Mustang. Our P-51, we have an airport in Virginia Beach. There are two airports in Virginia Beach. Oceana Naval Air Station, where the Navy practices. And there's a Virginia Beach International Airport. I say international, I flew from Canada and landed there one time. <laughs> uh, so, it's a private airport with a collection, one of, probably the world's largest collection of uh, flyable historic airplanes. Smithsonian has more than us, but they, theirs don't fly. <laughs> and what, tomorrow is Saturday. We've got over a thousand Girl Scouts coming out to the, our airport. Uh, and uh, they're going to get their aviation badge, the Girl Scout. Mm -hmm. And I'm going out to uh, practice flying the Mustang a little bit more tomorrow. So tomorrow, if you look toward the east, southeast from here, and if you see a single engine airplane with a V-12 uh, engine in the front built by Rolls-Royce Merlin, uh, you might see me flying the Mustang. Last weekend, uh, I did some practice landings. I flew over my house on the Lynn Haven River, circled it a couple of times, flew over my daughter's house on the north end of Virginia Beach, circled that a couple of times, called up Oceana, can I do a low pass down your runway? They, what kind of airplane? Certainly you can, sir. Uh, just please don't go below 500 feet. I said, fine. Get down to about 300. <laughs> and so, but, uh, and then I did some practice flying. I flew to North Carolina. I went to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, where the first airplane ever flew uh, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. at the Wright Brothers, and I flew down the runway there, uh, and then came back and shot three landings at our airport, and so tomorrow I'll do the same thing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, are we, are we done?